uh, the extension master gardener program is a part of the cooperative extension of the land grant universities, Virginia State and Virginia Tech. Um, and oops, we are um, one of 62 units throughout the state. The master gardeners in 2019, before COVID hit, had about 150 volunteers that contributed over 13,000 volunteer hours just to our community here. Um, we, the Piedmont Master Gardeners are the nonprofit association that supports the over 20 some um, programs and projects in our Albemarle Charlottesville area. So now I'm going to stop sharing and um, Steve will um, be able to share his slides and I will introduce Steve Spitzer is, um, hails to us in, originally from the Winchester area. Um, and after graduating from Virginia Tech in 1979, Steve worked for 37 years building his accounting firm, taking it from about 20 accountants to over 100 accountants. So while he performed tax and auditing services, his specialty became forensic accounting, where he helped many clients with some of the difficult issues. So after retiring from his career in public accounting, he moved to Florida in 2016 and then started building his own butterfly garden at, at, and as a University of Florida Lee County Master Gardener, he started presenting programs encouraging the pollinator gardens. So when he moved back here, he joined the Piedmont Master Gardeners and actually took the class all over again and, and um, He's become known as Steve the Milkweed and Monarch Man. So as a master, a Piedmont Master Gardener, Steve will assist in the development of the pollinator gardens at the center. Um, and we're actually working on uh, some pollinator plants in pots at the center as well. So uh, welcome, Steve. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, very, very excited to do this presentation. Uh, hope, hope we all can uh, learn something from this today because that's the thing is being a master gardener, I uh, always say I learn something new every day. Um, so, so as I was saying, um, the, the question might be how did, how did I even think about doing a presentation along this line on talking about pollinator gardening with three fire pots. So uh, as Fern told you, um, I was a Lee County Master Gardener in Southwest Florida. And, you know, I realized there there's a lot of condos, there's a lot of patio homes. Uh, there's a lot of homes that don't have yards. Um, for big plantings or whatever. But I wanted to make it sure it was possible that people knew they could attract pollinators to their living areas uh, without having an actual garden in the ground. Uh, and so that's how we got to this idea. And um, so um, I want to talk a little bit about my pictures as we go along. Um, this picture, Eastern Tiger Swallowtail, and it is on uh, swamp milkweed. Uh, some of you may know the swamp milkweed is a host plant for the monarch butterfly. Uh, but as you can see, it is also a nectar or a food source plant for other butterflies as well. Um, this picture is from my gardens. Um, most of the pictures in the presentations are from my gardens. Um, the uh, swamp milkweed last year drew in uh, a lot of different pollinators. Oh, I, had, I had a huge amount of bumblebee population. Uh, I even, even felt like one day I had a hummingbird checking out the milkweed, but it could have just been other things in the garden uh, that the uh, hummingbird was passing by in order to reach. 
So why are we, why would we want to do this? Why should you want to do this? Um, well, in the picture, uh, this is a sunflower. And um, on the sunflower is the bee. Um, what's going on with our pollinators is we are losing a lot of the species, like for instance, 25% of the bumblebee species are at risk of extinction. Um, if you follow the flight of the uh, monarch butterfly, you will know that its numbers have been declining rapidly. Um, so if we each do a little part, um, we can help with the pollinator populations and providing them the resources that they need. Um, it's very important to realize that without the pollinators, there are many of our food crops that would never be pollinated. They're very, the pollinators are very critical even for our own existence. Um, the loss of pollinators, I think what we know, it can be because of climate change, it can be because of the insecticides, it could be the destruction of habitat areas. Uh, most of those things, we're not in a position to where we can control that individually. But what we can do definitely individually is do our part in creating a habitat for the pollinators, no matter how large, maybe you got big garden space, that's good to use the garden space for the pollinators. But if you don't, even if you just have a small patio, you could do the pollinator pots and provide some homes for the pollinators. I gotta say, working with the pollinators has been one of the most satisfying aspects of my, my life. Uh, the personal enrichment that you can uh, receive from just watching the pollinators work uh, the flyers and all are just amazing. Uh, and I so often feel when I am working uh, in my pollinator beds that uh, the pollinators often will look at me and they'll look at me as if to say, uh, thank you for what you're doing. It's very rewarding. So here in central Virginia, we're very fortunate to have quite a few different types of pollinators. We have the butterflies and moths. And within the butterflies, we have the eastern tiger swallowtails, the black swallowtails, fritteraries, monarchs, buckeyes, and etc. cetera. Uh, there are really a lot of butterflies and moth species are all around. Bees, we have social bees and we have solitary bees. We have the mason bees, which are workhorses of the uh, pollinators. Uh, we have the hummingbirds. We have the ruby-throated hummingbird. And then we also have beetles, flies, and wasps. And yes, whether we like it or not, the beetles, flies, and wasps are also pollinators. And they do a very good job with what they do. So even though they can be a nuisance at times, we need to be tolerant of the beetles, flies, and wasps. But since they're not quite as exciting as the butterflies, moths, and bees, I'm not going to talk about them so much today. So in order to do your pollinator pot project, you're going to need some materials. Obviously, you're going to need the pots. You're going to need planting soil you're going to need nectar and host plants. So what do I mean by nectar and host plants? Um, you can do this project and you can have those nectar plants if you want to. The nectar plants are the plants that the butterflies, the bees, the hummingbirds will come to for the nectar, or in other words, the pollen and they will spread that pollen from one flower to another 
and therefore that's why they're called pollinators. Uh, but that is their food source as a butterfly or as a bee. Now, I do think in order to have a very interesting pollinator garden, you do need host plants. Host plants are those plants that different butterflies want to lay their eggs on, that then when the caterpillars hatch from the eggs, those host plants serve as a food source for those caterpillars. For instance, the monarch butterflies, they need milkweed. They need milkweed to lay their eggs on, and the caterpillars that hatch from those monarch eggs then feed on um, that milkweed plant. Um, monarch caterpillars will not feed on other plants. So um, again, you can do your pollinator pots with just nectar plants, but uh, to have a very interesting uh, study for your pollinator pots, I would recommend that you do some type of host plant within the pots. So let's talk about the pots. Uh, you can see here in the picture, we have all types of pots. We have rectangle pots, we have round pots, we have uh, pots that are smaller, larger, taller, uh, all different colors. Uh, pots can be made out of ceramics, clay, plastic, but when it all comes down to the end, what's the most important part of a pot? If you look at the picture in the middle, you see the hole in the bottom of the pot. So whatever you do with your pots, you want to make sure you have a hole in the bottom. That hole is there so that when it would rain a lot, or if you just happen to overwater, the water can escape and your plants won't become waterlogged. So that's a very important part. Now, um, so it doesn't matter if you buy extremely expensive uh, clay pots or whether you buy plastic pots. You just need to make sure you have the holes in the bottom. And I know there's a lot of plastic pots that come that don't have a hole in the bottom, but it's very easy to put a hole in the bottom of a plastic pot. Uh, a little bit harder on a ceramic pot, um, but, but that is right there, the most important part of the pot. Your planting soil. In order to have a good planting soil, um, should have different ingredients within that potting soil. Um, uh, there's products that, that the ingredients, peat, bark, core, vermiculite, perlite fertilizer. You, could, you can accumulate all of these ingredients. You can go online and find different recipes for potting mix. But what you may find it's a lot simpler to already to buy already prepared planting soil than to be mixing your own. But it's very important that you know what's within the soil. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, peat. Uh, peat, it takes over a hundred years for peat to form. So it's not a sustainable product. Uh, a lot of us are now using core, which is really just coconut dust, using core in place of the peat. And uh, personally, with seeds I started this year, I used core and uh, had very good success. So uh, that's a consideration for that. Uh, also keep in mind, um, if you buy a general purpose 
uh, planting soil. You want to find one that's compost-based, and it would also be preferable not to have one with a lot of fertilizer or be good not to have any fertilizer, simply because if you do end up planting native plants, you probably will not need a lot of fertilizer. Uh, one of the most important parts for this planting soil is to make sure you're getting an organic planting soil. Uh, the reason you want to make sure it's organic, of course, the plants are growing in the soil, and of course the pollinators are then using the plants, so you want to make sure there's no chemicals, pesticide residues or whatsoever in your soil or it could have an impact on the plants. Okay, so we talked earlier about the plants and we're going to talk some more about the nectar and the host plants. Uh, nectar plants to consider. Uh, I'm going to be very honest, this is the fun part of doing a pollinator pot project because there's so many beautiful nectar plants out there to consider. It's, it's just simply amazing. Um, these, are, these are just ones that um, I like. So, you know, you don't have to, you certainly don't need to limit yourself to these. Um, and once we get to the back end and the references, there's some publications that will help you uh, look at different types of nectar plants and also different host plants. So, but um, these different plants here are some of my favorites. Um, you're probably starting to tell that I do love my monarch butterflies, and you can see there at the bottom of the nectar plant, the butterfly milkweed is a nectar plant, and it serves as a nectar plant for all types of uh, butterflies. Um, so that's a very, very nice uh, nectar plant. So when you're working on accumulating your plants, for uh, your pots. You need to make sure they're pollinator friendly. And these different things that we're gonna talk about is what makes them pollinator friendly. First and foremost, uh, if they're native to our area, um, they're going to be better for the pollinators uh, than rather than plants that are not native to our area. Uh, how do you know what our area is? Our area here in our Murrell County is zone seven. Now, uh, zone seven compared to where I used to be in Southwest Florida, Southwest Florida was zone 11. So you can see what I'm saying as you come further north, the numbers become smaller. So if you bought a plant that said um, zone nine, you may get it to live during the summer, but you're not going to get it to live any longer. Um, if you use a plant that says zone five, it will probably be fine here and through the winter. Um, it's good to have a different variety of plants with different blooming periods, and that will keep pollinators coming for a longer period of time. Uh, you need to pick between your annuals and your perennials. Now, the difference between your annuals and your perennials, your annuals are plants that will last a year. Your perennials, uh, can and often will last a lot longer than just one year. Now, uh, there's some question in regards to perennials, how they will do in pots over the winter, but 
I got to tell you from experimentation, I had perennials and pots last summer. I sat them back under cover on my porch. I did not water them all winter, but a lot of them are alive today. So they did survive the pots and did so really without a whole lot of care. So I'll make sure this coming winter, I take a different approach and uh, make sure they get a little water along the way. Um, it's very important, again, that you practice organic along with native. When you go to a garden center, you probably need to ask specifically which plants are native uh, and make sure that they've been grown in soil that hadn't had pesticides applied or had pesticides applied afterwards. Um, some of the garden centers, it's not very clear what are native or what's non-native plants. So it's always good to ask to make sure that you're buying native plants. Uh, another aspect you need to consider for your plants is the sun. Um, so the question becomes, where are you going to put your pots? If your pots are going to be where they receive sun for six hours or more, your sun plants are going to be fine. But if your pots are going to be in the shade all day, you're probably going to need to look for plants that are shade tolerant. In this picture is the monarch caterpillar. He is on swamp milkweed. He is hanging upside down. This is, this is his head. And you can see he's munching away on the leaf. And that's why I say to have some host plants, you get to see the beauty of uh, the caterpillars. Uh, because I, I, I just think that's just a beautiful caterpillar, beautiful creature. So some pictures, um, the pictures on the right and the left are from decorative pots at my house. Uh, you can see the swallowtail is on the lantana. And then here, a very interesting little creature uh, some of you have not seen this little fellow before. That's a hummingbird moth. And it's, you know, it's not like I sat and watched these deck rail boxes all the time in order to catch pictures. Uh, it's just so happened I caught those couple. Uh, very interesting. If you look at the swallowtail, you can tell that it's the butterfly has aged from some of the deterioration in the wings. But still a very, very beautiful, beautiful creature. Uh, in the middle, you'll see monarchs, one flying, one on cinia. Uh, that's from a picture here locally in Crozet. And uh, this was in uh, late summer, early fall, and these are the migrating monarchs coming through. Um, they were on their way from further north and ultimately headed to Mexico. And just, just the whole flight of the monarchs, just a very interesting uh, story in and of itself. And uh, I do hope at one point in time there'll be uh, some interest in, I would love to do a presentation about the monarchs and their uh, status of how they're surviving at this point and also the journey that they make. Uh, 
Okay, so if you're going to put some host plants into your pots, ones to consider. Uh, again, uh, butterfly milkweed. That should serve as a host plant for monarchs, gray hair streaks, and queens. Fennel dill, parsley, golden alexander will work for black swallowtails. The New England asters will serve many species of native caterpillars. Uh, uh, Fritillary butterflies like striped cream violets. Um, so these, again, this is not a total listing of host plants. There are many host plants for you to consider. Again, a few more pictures. Uh, on the right, we have a fritterary on a zinnia. We have Eastern Tiger Swallowtail on bee balm. And in the middle, we have the bumblebee on swamp milkweed. Now, so the bumblebee, at this point in time, there's probably a question out there that you're starting to ponder. Do I need to worry about getting stung? And the answer is yes, of course you do. Now, what do you do in order to try to avoid from getting stung? you need to consider doing your maintenance of your pots early in the morning. Uh, the pollinators are less active. Uh, I always watered the swamp milkweed when it needed some water early in the mornings. And uh, the bumblebees never bothered me. Uh, if you do have any type of sewer, severe allergic reactions to the bees. However, this is probably not a project you should consider. But I don't want to scare you away from a project. If you are a little bit timid and worried about that, I just suggest again, do early morning maintenance. And you may want to wear a long sleeve shirt and uh, pants just to uh, help with any concern you may have in that regard. Okay, so these pictures again, we got the monarch butterfly, an up close picture of a monarch butterfly. And to me, it's very easy to see why it's called the monarch. Uh, definitely king of butterflies. Oh, I just love to watch them fly. I love to watch them work the plants. Oh, it's just very awesome. So you come over to the middle picture, and there may be some of you looking at this picture thinking, well, there's another monarch caterpillar. However, that is not a monarch caterpillar. That is a black swallowtail caterpillar. You will notice this is kind of on a cup that you would buy, for instance, at a place like Lowe's, which I did buy this at Lowe's. And the reason I bought it at Lowe's was this guy was already on this little pot at Lowe's, except he didn't look anything like this at the time. A black swallowtail caterpillar, when in its infancy, looks more like a bird dropping than what it does a caterpillar. So I guess what I'm telling you is if you do have parsley, dill, fennel, carrots, uh, you do need to look at them if you've been seeing black swallowtail butterflies flying around. Uh, you may have eggs and you may have um, uh, little caterpillars that look like bird droppings, 
So you, you, you don't want to get rid of uh, those things in their infancy because they're going to become this beautiful caterpillar and obviously ultimately a beautiful butterfly. Um, this last picture right there in the middle is a fritterary. Now this is a picture of a garden um, that my wife took at a local golf course. And it's very exciting to see golf courses, schools, other areas where there are open spaces that they're creating pollinator gardens. And so why do I bring this up at this point in time is whenever you have an opportunity to encourage others to pursue uh, open space that they do have to create these pollinator gardens, it's, it's all, it's good for all of us. When I say that, I mean all of us, we are all very dependent upon these pollinators uh, to help us. So uh, make sure if you ever do have an opportunity to talk about the beauty of such gardens, please be sure to do so. So on your pots, uh, it's a matter of how do you want to design your pots? Um, and one way to do it is to use the filler, spiller, and thriller approach. Uh, this can make a very beautiful and attractive uh, presentation. I have to tell you, the pollinators themselves, they do not care in the leaves, but if you're putting these on your patios or in your front door areas or wherever you, you have friends, guests, or you set yourself and to enjoy, uh, it's a matter of uh, designing the pot in a way that it's enjoyable for you. Uh, thrillers are plants that have height. They add, usually add some type of thrill. They're usually placed in the center or the rear of the pot, just depending upon where you have your pot located. The fillers are plants that just fill out around the pot. They're placed around the thriller. And the spillers are the plants that hang over the edge of the pot, creating a cascading effect. And I've seen many examples of these type of pots with the filler, spiller, and thriller approach. And, you know, they can have quite a wow factor. So for instance, let's walk through one. Let's say I'm going to create one of these pollinator pots using the filler, spiller, and thriller approach. So on the right-hand side, uh, we have a uh, liatris, which will get tall, could serve as a thriller. In the middle, Butterfly weed with very beautiful tops. And remember, butterfly weed will function as a nectar plant and also as a host plant for the monarch. And then there's the phlox that will have some cascading effect in the pot. Now, you could put all three of these in the pot. And I know what some of you are thinking right now, because you're looking at the colors of us and saying, Steve, you're obviously colorblind. They don't go that well together. Well, this is where your creativity comes into play. For me, I think this is beautiful. Now, some people might say it's been a little bit better with a white flock, but it's a matter of how do you want to put your pot together. It's a matter of um, your creativity. There's no limitations on the imagination. You could take all three of these plants, since you got three pots, and you put one 
of these on each of the three pots if you so choose. Now at this point in time, I do want to say also keep in mind swamp milkweed, and then you saw some pictures of the swamp milkweed, it gets a very pretty pink flower on the swamp milkweed. Some people don't really wouldn't want to consider that as attractive for the pot, but it does also another one serves as a nectar and a host plant. Um, so my last comment on um, the creation of the pots and all is let's do our part to help save the monarchs. Let's plant some milkweed. Um, as Armorong County, Piedmont Master Gardeners, uh, we have a horticulture help desk. And here is the email address and the phone number for our help desk. Uh, as Master Gardener volunteers, we man the help desk. And we love to get the questions from you in regards to your gardening. Uh, and any, any way that we can help you, we love to have the questions. Uh, I know from experience when I work at the help desk, if I don't have any questions to answer, it can get boring. So please keep in mind, any way we can help you, there's the email and the phone number. Another, another thing you should consider doing is signing up on the uh, PiedmontMasterGardeners.org website, signing up for the Garden Shed, which is a free monthly newsletter with always great articles. When I moved up here from Florida to Virginia, uh, I immediately signed up for the Garden Shed. Uh, that was long before I thought I would have the opportunity to become a master gardener here. Uh, also on that website, there's upcoming events and classes. And then um, I also need to say, please think about becoming a master gardener. Um, now I've been a master gardener in Florida and now a master gardener here. It is so rewarding. It is so fulfilling to have the contact with people to help them with issues, problems, uh, uh, to learn continuously from other master gardeners and other aspects, other uh, aspects of the gardening businesses. So please consider uh, becoming a master gardener. Uh, in the references, I told you that there would be some publications that could really help you with your nectar plants and host plants. The first listing for the birds, butterflies, and hummingbirds creating inviting habitats. That is an excellent publication. Uh, please make note of that one. Um, from the standpoint, it will help you in choosing the plants that you want for your pollinator pots. Uh, the second article talks about container and raised bed gardenings and what you should consider. Those are some very good uh, references. Uh, with that, um, I think it's probably time. Let's we'll see if we got any questions, Fern. Yes, uh, the, the first question was, uh, what size pots are you talking about to use the filler, spriller, and thriller approach? Uh, I've done, I've done, different sizes. Um, in fact, there's, there's one pot that um, my wife and I brought back up with us from Florida that actually sets probably about three feet high with a 12 inch round hole in the top. Uh, we were just talking about that one this morning. And, and honestly, we don't want dirt in that thing from for three feet high or we never would be able to move it. So uh, we're gonna actually fill it up with uh, 
styrofoam, probably the peanuts, and, and leave enough room to put another pot in the top. And what we envision is if you go to the garden centers, there's a lot of the pots that will have uh, hanging baskets that then have a cascading effect down over. So, uh, you know, that one's going to work well. Now, other, uh, another example I got, and, you know, this is, this is where I hate that we're doing this by Zoom now because whenever I do these kind of classes, I like to bring exhibits along. Uh, I actually have, in my front yard, I have a combination of three pots. I have a very uh, uh, square, flat pot. I have a round pot that sits on top of that with a smaller, taller round pot sitting on those two. So it's a three level pot. So my top pot, top pot is my thriller, my middle pot is my filler, and then I have my cascading items in the bottom. So um, I, don't, I don't think there's any particular size um, requirement. Um, I, I think you could do it with just a single, like say a 12 inch pot. It would just be a small display. Now, obviously the more room you have, and the bigger the pots you can use, uh, it will look better within your area that you're trying to uh, decorate. And also it gives you more plant material to pull in the pollinators. And I would add to that, that um, I typically think of 15 inch or greater, you know, for, for a uh, pot that you're gonna do perennial type host and nectar plants in because those, those you're going to keep in there from year to year, potentially. Okay, the next question is, uh, do you have a favorite nursery or any recommendation? And then someone put in the Hummingbird Hill Native Plant Nursery on Free Union Road. Yeah, it's uh, the Hummingbird Hill is one. Oh, I found Hummingbird Hill uh, by accident, more or less, because we stayed at a little place out past Free Union at one point before we moved back up to Virginia. And so I found it by accident, but I love going there. Of course, last year was a, an odd year, so I never got to go, but I haven't checked recently to see if they're open back up, but I think that they are. Uh, that's a good one. I think we got a lot of wonderful nurseries around. I think the most important part is making sure you uh, are ascertaining that you're buying native plants and also plants that are free of pesticides. And another person has put in the Hill House Nursery in Castleton. Um, there's also a new one in Nelson County. I think it's called Twin Leaf, just opened. Uh, and it looks like it's got a pretty good size operation going. So that's gonna be another um, source of plants. But what I'd like to encourage everybody is to start asking all of our local nurseries uh, to, you know, to, to actually stock more of the straight species native plants. And um, you know, the more they hear that, the, the more, and, and we're actually starting a campaign uh, for the Piedmont area, our, our Albemarle Charlottesville area to, to promote the, the native plants. And we'll be talking to the nurseries and retailers to, to hopefully get them to stock more. Okay. Um, somebody asked about the um, slides being available and, and we told them that they will have the recording available. Um, Another person put in that the corner store on 29 in Ruckersville or Millmont in Waynesboro are good sources for, for native pollinator plants and host plants. So true. 
So I hope that we will get our pots at the, the center planted actually as a demonstration site. Um, and then we'll, we'll be putting in a bed design, we hope in the fall, um, but so that we hope that you'll come by and visit, visit that site once we've got that planted. Um, and it's just a lot of fun to, to uh, kind of explore with different plants. <laughs> Yeah, it, it really is. I know um, last year was really my first year being able to get out and garden here. Um, didn't really have much else to do last year, given that we had to stay home. So I was able to plant gardens, but I was very disappointed and I uh, did not see any monarchs. So uh, uh, I'm kind of like, wow, what, what did I do wrong? And, uh, but they did start showing up in July. Now I gotta say, since I've gotten my gardens up and going, I have, I've had monarch caterpillars in the past two weeks. So it was very exciting to see uh, that they are here. Uh, so you know, I really encourage you to uh, do this. Uh, one thing, uh, I meant to say is if you do, if what you have room for is just pollinator pots and you do that and you do put some milkweed there and at some point you have more caterpillars than what you do milkweed so you're worried about them, please reach out to me and I'll find a home for those caterpillars for you. Any more questions? Oh, Terry has just put in the chat box that the Wintergreen Nature Foundation promotes and sells natives. And that's so true. They tend to have a sale about this time of the year as well. And they're a great source. Well, Jennifer, I think if there's no other questions, thank you, Steve, that was very good. Well, I sure appreciate everyone tuning in and listening and uh, very, very excited to be a Piedmont Master Gardener and I'm uh, working with the other Master Gardeners and working with the community here. It's very exciting. So thank you for tuning in.